Um, and uh, we can always let people in throughout. I just want to say welcome to everybody. Uh, let everybody know that we are recording this and it will be going on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you have any questions or comments about us recording, just uh, send me a message in the chat or uh, you can always email me at North Florida Green Chamber at Gmail. So welcome to our Tuesdays at two. This is a meeting that the Green Chamber has every week. It's a check-in and it's our chance to share some of the cool topics that we have at the Green Chamber that we run, we run into local speakers um, or local topics that the Green Chamber thinks is newsworthy that we want the community to know about. So it's our chance to um, have a, a, a weekly touch base with people uh, and also share information that is worth talking about. We will have a little discussion period at the end also. Uh, the North Florida Green Chamber of Commerce, if you have not heard of us, we are a chamber of commerce. Uh, we feel it is our job to make it cool and convenient to be green. And what we mean by that is we want it to be cool, as in valued. Uh, we want the community to value green choices or sustainable choices. So if a business owner um, decides to make uh, part of their business plan uh, a sustainable choice, we want not only the business owner to feel that that is valued, we want the community to value that. And that's uh, part of the job of the Green Chamber is to get that message out. We also wanna make it convenient to be green. So what we mean by that is we have, when we, we are creating projects, um, toolkits, programs that make it either less expensive to be green um, or make it easier and convenient. So you'll see on our website, our benefits are geared towards either making it cool or convenient to be green. With that, we're gonna get started with our Tuesday at two because this is a very quick meeting. It's 30 minutes. Um, because it's a quick meeting, we ask that there that you follow some rules and some structure. Please keep your microphone muted until it's your turn to talk. Please no questions during the presentation since it's gonna go pretty quick. We have uh, time designated at the end for questions. Um, and if you do at the end want to speak, please just raise your hand um, either in the video or on your, uh, ch I think there's one on the chat box. Um, we will let our speaker uh, get started after a quick icebreaker. And then at the end, we will open it up for Q&A and um, we, we highly encourage audience discussion and participation. So at the end will be your chance to share your comments uh, as well as your questions. And then we will close it all out with what your Tuesday takeaway is. So with that, we're gonna jump into an icebreaker. Part of the job of the North Florida Green Chamber is to network. So we want uh, business owners who value sustainability to meet other people in the community, other business owners, um, possible customers, clients. Uh, we want people to network. So um, in the spirit of networking, we ask that everybody please put their name into the chat box, uh, including our speakers if you can. Put any contact information that you feel comfortable sharing. So whether it's a phone number, uh, an email address, or just a website, or maybe even just the company you work at in a title, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, um, we really do encourage people to connect. Uh, since you're all here look, uh, interested in the same topic, this is a chance to connect with other people in the community that share the same interests. And I'm gonna give you 90 seconds to do your icebreaker and put your name and contact in. And while we do that, we have one of our UNF interns on the call today, and she's gonna give us, um, it's Ashley Stevenson. Hi, Ashley. Um, you're, make sure you're on mute, there you go. Um, Ashley's gonna give us a 90 second presentation while everybody's doing their icebreaker. All right, hey everyone. So today I'm just quickly gonna talk a little bit about EcoTalk, which is a TikTok account that is fighting for green knowledge and actions among Gen Z and millennials. Um, so EcoTalk is basically comprised of like 20 environmental advocates who try to get the attention of young people on TikTok. Um, so the formula behind it is kind of similar to that of accounts like the Hype House you guys might know about. Um, that's a viral account that is shared by viral creators. Um, although each creator does post on their own TikTok account, um, they can gain exposure and experience community by being a part of that group account. 
Um, and as with the Hype House, each member of EcoTalk has an individual TikTok account as well. Um, and they usually are individually fighting for green knowledge and actions on that account as well. Um, but a little bit about the account, um, it was created in July of 2020, kind of in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and it currently already has 88.1 thousand followers. So it's grown pretty quickly. Um, and in their bio, they are the self-proclaimed environmentalists of TikTok. They provide a link to the climate and energy section of the Gates Notes website. Um, so the content of their TikTok covers things like animal extinction, climate change, fuel emissions, recycling right, and even greenwashing. Um, but overall, it's just a great example of how influencing for good can work on TikTok um, and it can take advantage of trends to raise awareness about going green. Um, I think this could be a great way of educating young people because it meets them where they are. TikTok is already super popular um, and the algorithm makes it super easy to um, kind of have people randomly stumble upon that account. Um, so I'm going to link the account in the chat um, if you guys kind of want to check it out more or share it with a young person in your life, but that's all I have for you. Great. Thank you. A lot of wonderful information in 90 seconds. <laughs> And I think I pretty much have everybody's um, information in the chat box. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it off to our speakers today. Um, they're gonna introduce the topics and themselves, but we have uh, Associate Professor Josh Gellers with political, uh, political Science Associate Professor at UNF and Thea Baker, Thea Baker, um, and she is a grad student at USF. And I believe a sustainable, correct? Global sustainability, yes. Global sustainability, wonderful. We have very, very good topic today. I'm very excited for this topic. So with that, um, I will let you guys take over. All right, well, thank you very much, Christina, and happy to be here talking with everyone about an uh, excellent new report that Thea just produced. So if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Yep. So the sustainable development goals are a global blueprint for achieving sustainable development objectives between the years of 2015 and 2030 as part of the UN's uh, Agenda 2030. And they comprise 17 goals, which also include 169 different uh, targets and then many more indicators pertaining to each of those goals. And so the idea is that both developed and developing countries will pursue each of these goals to create a more sustainable future. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is where I jump in. Um, so for a class I had last semester, I did a project on S um, Jacksonville and the SDGs. And the goal of the project was to determine how the city of Jacksonville measures up to the each of the SDGs um, and overall if Jacksonville had adopted them. Um, and Jacksonville has not committed to achieving the SDGs. Um, but again, I still wanted to measure how it was doing for compared to each goal. Um, and just as a comparison, the city of Orlando has adopted them through um, one of their organizations and that's the Global Shaper Orlando. So that's, that's a, a link that has been included here, um, just for comparison. Next slide. So as Josh mentioned, um, every SDG has several targets and at least one indicator per target. There's 169 targets in total. Um, for an example, we have goal one, which is no poverty, or more specifically, end poverty in all its forms everywhere. And target 1.2 for this goal is to reduce those living in poverty by half. And indicator 1.2.1 uses the proportion of population living below the national poverty line. So for the US, I looked at the US federal poverty line, which is an annual income of 13,000 per year for a one person household, 17,000 per year for a two person household, it increases from there. Um, in Duval County in 2015, when the goals were set, the percentage living in poverty was 17%. So to meet that target, by 2030, the deadline for the SDGs, only 8.7% of Duval residents should be living in poverty. So next slide. So this top graph shows the percent of population living in poverty over time. Um, in Duval County, there is a downward trend that we've seen since 2015. And if that exact trend continues, Duval County will be on track to meet target 1.2. 
Um, but so Duval County is the blue line. If you look at the red line, you can see that Duval County's poverty lanes, rates are consistently lower than the national average. So Jacksonville still needs to do better with this goal. And then also I looked at the, um, separated this by gender. And so the bottom graph, you can see that while only 13% of males living in Duval County live in poverty, only 17% or of females do. So you can see a relation between SDG 1, which is no poverty, and SDG 5, which is gender equality. And you'll see links between all of these goals um, throughout this presentation, because as you try to fix one, you're going to help others. And as others fall behind, um, other goals are going to also fall behind. So next slide. Elaborating a little more on SDG 1, I wanted to show this map which displays a distribution of those living, living in poverty in Duval County. In the blue areas, only 1.5% of residents live in poverty. In the red areas, up to 56% of residents live in poverty. And as you can see, East Jacksonville has far less preva prevalence of poverty than West Jacksonville. So focus needs to be on lifting those in West Jacksonville out of poverty. And I included a little quote from Katrine Bull, which states, inequalities in economic status often follow inequalities in health, which are prevalent in Duval County. So this way you can see SDG 1 is linked closely with SDG 3, good health and well-being, which I'll discuss a little later. Next slide. So SDG 2 is to end hunger. Um, and while I couldn't find any analytical data on the prevalence of hunger trends in Jacksonville, I did find a few startling statistics. Um, and these include that one out of five adults and one out of four children don't know where their next meal is coming from in North Florida. Or that 330,000 people are food insecure in North Florida and that there are 200,000 residents that receive food stamps, totaling over $340 million annually. I also recently found out that Jacksonville has 40 food deserts, which basically means there are no food or no grocery stores within the vicinity. Um, for instance, in Newtown, which is a food desert in West Jacksonville, the nearest grocery store is 2.3 miles away. This is a huge deal if you don't own a car, which many residents in these areas don't because they're also living in poverty or with low income. And this was a startling fact to me to realize that one of my many privileges is that living in Jacksonville Beach, I have access to not only one, but three grocery stores within 1.5 miles of my house. And so many Jacksonville residents don't have this privilege. In these food deserts, the only places for residents to buy food are corner stores, gas stations, and fast food restaurants. And I can assure you that you won't find any broccoli, kale, or produce at any of these places. So while residents may have access to calories at these places, they don't have access to nutrients. And this further exacerbates their health issues. So you can see that SDG 2 is linked closely with SDG 3, good health and well-being. And there are already programs in place to combat hunger, including public programs such as SNAP, the National School Lunch Program, and WIC. Um, and there's also private programs such as food pantries, soup kitchens, and community gardens. And in Jacksonville, it was actually determined that 32,000 people were fed from community gardens in 2014. So this was a really cool fact to find out. Um, and some of these community gardens are listed here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but we have the UNF's OGR Gardens, which provide food to their own food pantry. And then we have White Harvest Farms, which is a 10.5 acre regenerative farm that grows fresh produce for their food desert community. Um, but in order to give a more accurate assessment of how Jacksonville measures up to SDG 2, I would need more data. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised that there are many programs available to attempt to distribute more food to the hungry. But the fact that there are so many hungry people still in Northeast Florida is a problem that needs addressing. Um, and so these programs are a great band-aid to the problem, but we need to address the root cause of the problem, which is pulling these residents out of poverty. So next slide. So moving on to SDG 3, which is good health and well-being. Um, in my paper, in my project, I did analyze many targets and there was a lot more data for this SDG. Um, but here I'll just discuss one as an example. We have target 3.2, which focuses on ending newborn deaths, aiming to reduce neonatal mortality to at least as low as 12 per 1,000 live births. 
So the graph graph on the left plots that for Duval County in blue and Florida in gray for 2010 through 2019. And you can see both areas lie far below the global target, which is great. But it needs to be noted that this global target for these SDGs is a target for all countries in the world, so both developing and developed nations. And I think that the US or Florida or even the city of Jacksonville should set a stricter target um, because we're already started so far below that specific target. Um, and you can see there's no positive or negative trend, which is neither good nor bad. Um, but it is clear here that Duval County um, has higher rates than Florida rates. So that is an area for improvement. And then in relation to this goal, we've got this map on the right, which is life expectancy by zone in Duval County. You can see the lowest life expectancy is in central Jacksonville, that, that red area on the west side. Um, and this, I thought it was very interesting that this map uh, correlated really closely with that poverty rates map from two slides ago. Um, and so you can tell that those living in poverty have a lower life expectancy. Um, so it's clear that goal three goes hand in hand with goal one and poverty. And then it also goes hand in hand with goal four, which is quality education, which I'm not really touching on in this presentation, but um, it's definitely something that Jacksonville needs to focus on and has already has um, some focus on, but will need improvement. So next slide. So goal eight, SDG eight, is decent work and economic growth. And I would say that this is the sustainable development goal that has already received the most resources and achieving in Jacksonville, because most people already realize the need for economic prosperity. However, there still are many areas for improvement and the, the other goals cannot be addressed without continuing, continuing to address this goal. So this graph here plots, plots personal income per capita, which sits right at about 46,000 per year in 2018. Um, and you can see that the orange line, which is for Duval County, ranks consistently lower than Florida. Um, so there's, we need to improve a little bit there. And also I wanted to note that the incline seems great, but this graph doesn't represent how income is spread out between the highest, rate, highest earning citizens and the lowest earning citizens. So next slide. So in order to track that um, discrepancy, I plotted the median income over time, which is the top graph. As you can see, median income between 2011 and 2018 has stayed relatively stagnant. So higher earners may be earning more as the last graph showed, but median and lower income and lower earners are not earning an increasing wage. Also, I plotted here um, males and females, and there still exists a gender pay gap of almost $10,000 annually between males and females. So, and I also wanted to note that this pay gap exists across all job types, which have shown on the bottom graph. So it's not just that men are working higher paying jobs, men are earning more for the same types of jobs. So you, you can see a link here between goal eight and goal five, which is gender equality. And then also, I wanted to note that SDG 8 will obviously be linked to SDG 1, no poverty, because if we can create more and higher paying jobs, we can pull more people out of poverty. Next slide. So the last goal I wanted to touch on is goal 12, which is nearest and dearest to my heart, because I feel like it's linked to almost all of the other goals. SDG 12 is responsible consumption and production. So this can refer to consuming less energy, less water, wasting less food, and creating less, less waste in general. Energy consumption costs money and emits greenhouse gases leading to climate change. Water consumption requires energy emitting more greenhouse gases and also costs money. The incredible prevalence of overpackaged goods requires more burning of fossil fuels, further exacerbating climate change and creating more waste streams. Food waste causes methane, a greenhouse gas, more potent than carbon dioxide, and overall wastes the resources that went into getting the food to your table. Target 12.5 for this goal is by 2030, substantially reduce waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling, and reuse. So I've plotted here on this graph, on the, on the top graph, um, total tons of waste produced over time in Jacksonville. You can see the orange bars represent total tons of waste per person. And you can see a 150% increase between 2014, where we averaged two tons of waste per person, 
uh, to 20, or that was in 2014. And then in 2017, we averaged three tons of waste per person in Jacksonville. Um, and then it slightly decreases in 2019, but it's still incredibly high. Um, and then we also, on this graph, the blue line, we have recycling rates. Um, and we have a peak recycling rate of 58% materials recycled in 2017. Um, so I wanted to note that there have been improvements in residential recycling in Jacksonville in the last 10 years. Um, in 2012, the large, those large 96 gallon recycling bill bins were given out to every Jacksonville resident. And when those bins were given out, recycling rates doubled. However, still only 60% of residents use this service, even though they have access to it. So that needs to be improved. Also, I've noticed that many people don't fully understand what can and can't be recycled in their curbside bins. So constantly people are putting things that can't be recycled, such as plastic bags, which clogs the recycling material mach machinery and then costs the recycling facilities hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, and lastly, recycling in commercial or business facilities is highly lacking. Um, I think this is where we're lacking the most in, in Jacksonville. While commercial facilities account for 80% of the debris created in Duval County, um, they're only responsible for 68% of the recycled debris. Um, and then when comparing Duval County to the nine other top 10 most populated counties in Florida, Duval is far below its neighbors. As can be seen in the bottom graph, in most other populated counties, 100% of commercial facilities have a recycling service. But in Jacksonville, only 6% use a recycling service. So 94% of businesses in Jacksonville do not even recycle. Um, so that's a huge area of improvement for improvement that I've noticed. Um, so that's yeah. all I'm gonna cover for um, Jacksonville and the SDGs. Um, and I just wanted to note that um, while Jacksonville poverty rates are decreasing um, and are below average and mm -hmm. um, it was found that Jacksonville poverty rates are decreasing, but they are below average. Um, the resiliency of the poor needs major improvement, and the health of Jacksonville residents appears to either be declining or stagnating. Um, the only goal that Jacksonville government seems to prioritize is economic prosperity, with a huge focus on bringing jobs and economic growth to the city. However, Jacksonville is still not perfect and needs to work on gender wage discrimination. Um, and although there was data that I could find for goals one through eight and 12, um, tons of data was really hard to find or isn't out there. Um, so I think it would be beneficial for the city of Jacksonville to make a public commitment to the goals so that more resources can be put in place to track them and then provide assistance to the areas of highest concern. So that's all I have. Next slide. Thank you, Thea. So just to wrap things up and talk about how this might be applicable to the business community, we have a few things we wanted to mention. First is that companies can identify which sustainable development goals they are capable of tackling and then explore how they can implement them by looking at the resources that are provided here from UN Global Impact and SDG Compass. Second, uh, as Thea brilliantly described, a lot of the uh, different goals actually relate to one another in meaningful ways. So companies can explore synergies using best practices in green business like those that have been described by the North Florida Green Chamber of Commerce. And then finally, once organizations have made progress toward achieving the SDGs, this is something that they should be shouting from the tops of the roofs about. And so make an effort to promote through social media, through other forms of uh, distribution, their efforts to address the sustainable development goals in order to reap the benefits of the good that they're doing for the community and for the world. And so you can see here a little graph on the right side of this slide that talks about the different kinds of goals that are being pursued by companies. Uh, and you can see that the preponderance of companies that have done some work on SDGs have focused on climate action, uh, decent work and economic growth, and then responsible consumption production and gender equality. So a lot of the things that Thea already talked about with the addition of climate action. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, so we're gonna go into a discussion time. Um, that was 
Very, very good. I, I'm sad we only have about four minutes for discussion time because I think we're going to have a lot of questions. Um, anybody who wants to ask a question, um, please either raise your hand or type something. We're already getting stuff in the chat box. Um, Please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and if you're the only one with your hand raised, you can go ahead and just unmute. But I'm gonna read this first question in the chat. Who in Jacksonville City government is most engaged or responsible for sustainability? I guess I'll start. Um, and thank you for that question, Vicki. I think this is actually very difficult to answer right now because we're in the process of hiring a chief resiliency officer whose job will encompass a lot of issues related to sustainability. But in general, there are different aspects of sustainability that are being addressed by different agencies within the city government. Uh, you have the Environmental Protection Board, you've got Public Works, um, you've got, you know, we have our, our Chamber of Commerce, we have our, you know, our Green Chamber of Commerce as well. So there's a lot of diffuse ways in which the city is addressing sustainability, but we don't have it in the sort of holistic manner in which it's being pursued in cities like Orlando. Great question. Um, next question. Hmm. Well, um, I, while we're waiting for people to either, oh, here we go. Here's another question. Um, has the Maine Chamber of Commerce put out any statements? I honestly don't know the answer to that question, whether it's uh, you know the, the local chamber or the national one. Um, I imagine that there is a statement. Uh, I don't know if, if that is related to a question about the SDGs or just sort of sustainability in general, but I think that, um, I don't think that they have actually made a sort of commitment to the SDGs because we haven't at the federal level in general. Okay, uh, and then another question, uh, Vicki says, who or where should advocacy be focused for the city of Jacksonville? I think Fia would be uh, pretty well positioned to answer this one. So I think advocacy needs to be at all levels. Um, I know you asked focus, but we need to share with all of the residents what these SDGs are. And then we need city officials, we need business owners to acknowledge them so that they can show the residents you know, what they are doing to work towards these goals and so that we can see that there is progress being done because you want to see, you want to be able to track the progress um, so that people can, can see that progress is possible. Um, so I know that might not have answered it specifically, but I would say all levels. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And I think even from our business community, um, I really liked uh, your slide at the end talking about how businesses can um, contribute and promote this. And a lot of times it's just spreading spreading the message. Thea, I think you mentioned um, people don't really know how to recycle. And I'm noticing that every day. It's amazing to me how many people that are very well-minded uh, and very environmental and they're still recycling the wrong way. Um, so I think the SDGs, a lot of people don't know what it stands for. Um, a lot of people don't understand that there's the, these, these amount of goals that people can work towards. And I think uh, as far as the business community, um, I don't even think that the Green Chamber has a statement on the SDGs. So maybe we need to get one out, don't we? <laughs> um, and that, that gives me some ideas actually to, to work on. Um, any, any questions? I guess to add, um, in the in the education area, in in at UNF, at the other colleges in Jacksonville, and then also at elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, if we could get a course, if we could get, you know, one day a year, maybe around um, Earth Day or something like that, where they are presenting the goals to the kids so that the kids can go home and then talk to their parents, because I feel like that's a good way to get the message out to everybody. Yeah, that's wonderful. Have you been connected with the uh, um, the Green Champions, the Duval County Green Champions? No, I, I stumbled upon them, but I haven't been connected. Yeah, um, th that might be a good spot to start with that if you're if you're looking. Um, well, with that, it's actually believe it or not, it's two thirty. Does anybody have any last minute questions? No. Um, well. Thank you very much. I am going to take this to the, the last slide here. Um, and 
with a with a wrap up. Um, I would like everybody except for Josh and Thea. Can you please verbally um, express in the chat box um, what your Tuesday takeaway was and what you learned from today? And Josh and Thea, I will let you verbally tell us what your Tuesday takeaway was as everybody says goodbye. And I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about what you're going to say um, and invite everybody to please, um, if you would like to join us next week for our Tuesday at 2, uh, we have A1A Solar is going to be talking about clean energy and um, solar options which will be a very cool, uh, very interesting topic as well. So with that, um, what was your Tuesday takeaway? I'll go first real quick. Uh, I think that Thea's report, which was really excellent and something we haven't done before, highlights the need to track what we're doing and then also celebrate the progress that we're making towards achieving the SDGs. Yeah, I just wanted to agree and, and thank Josh and thank you guys for having me. Um, but I did want to note that we do have a ton of great programs going on in Jacksonville addressing you know one or the other. Um, but I do think a lot of these, the community and these programs need to work together and synergistically as Josh mentioned at 1.2 um, in order to combat the goals on a more um, holistic level. I second that. That was a great takeaway. And I agree completely with what we're seeing. So uh, people need to connect more. Um, and I hope that the Tuesday at 2 is a platform for those connections. Um, please, everybody, remember if, um, to um, save or copy your chat box with the contact information for um, the other people in the community that you might want to follow up with. And with that, I hope everybody has a wonderful week. Josh, thank you so much. Thea, your, your presentation was very, very good. I loved it. Um, thank you so much for being a speaker with us today. Thanks for having us and thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. Bye everybody. Nice to finally meet you, Thea. <laughs> Yes, same to you. I know we spoke over the phone once yeah. a long time ago, but... Well, I have to say, you know, so this whole thing came about because once I sent out your report to the list of people that were on the Special Committee on Resiliency, there was like a lot of interest immediately because it seemingly came out of nowhere. So, I mean, the work you've done is, is really fantastic. Um, you know, it, it sort of blazed a trail because no one had done it prior to you stepping in and, and working on it for a class of yours. So kudos to you for, you know, taking the initiative. Yeah, thanks. It's um, interesting because I'm going to school at USF, which is um, in Tampa, or um, there's other little areas right around there. And a lot of those cities, they have um, a committee for sustainability, and they have a sustainability officer. And so they've got resources in place to track these types of things or they've got interns um and so i do think that jacksonville could if i like that we have we're finally getting a resiliency officer um i just hope that it's also ties a little i i wouldn't say that resiliency is exactly sustainability so um i don't know it'd be nice if there could be a correlation um, between the two and then we could get some more resources in order to um, track more. Yeah, I, I completely agree with your assessment. And, you know, as someone who was part of those conversations about how we're defining resiliency, I was always pushing us to kind of broaden what we mean by it because I knew that, we're, you know, having a sustainability uh, office within the city was not going to be easily forthcoming. So we needed to sort of build that into what resiliency was because a lot of the conversation early on was just about flooding. And that's, as you know, from your studies, you know, resiliency is definitely more than that. And sustainability is sort of even broader than that. I, in fact, during the first meeting of what is now called Resilient Jacks, we were asked to talk about resiliency. And I said, resiliency is an admission of failure. It means that we already haven't done enough and we're now we're having to react and then hopefully get better in the future. And I said, that's not kind of the thinking that we should be applying here. We should be reinventing ourselves and thinking about how the city can be transformed in a way that is more sustainable so that resiliency is sort of like a, an offshoot of that. But, you know, 
the reality is that like five years ago, this conversation wasn't happening at all. Uh, and now here we are, and we're going to hire a chief resiliency officer. So I'll take the wins where I can get them. Yeah. Something mm -mm. Is happening on the yeah. I, I, I agree. I, I hated seeing your, um, your charts on how Jacksonville was behind on certain things. And the recycling rate one is, was the worst of all your charts. Um, the corporate recycling. And I don't know if you're looking to expand your report in any way, but I would look into the, uh, the fact that um, the city of Jacksonville owns Trail Ridge, the landfill. And other cities, that's not the case. So Jacksonville is, makes money when things go to the landfill, whereas other cities have to pay to put things in the landfill. So Jacksonville is a little bit different in that sense um, I, I'm, and maybe you can look at what other cities, I don't have the, the statistics for you. Um, I just know that in general, most cities don't own their own landfill. It's usually a private landfill and they pay to use it. So they are incentivized, the city to recycle, whereas Jacksonville is the opposite. So there is that. And I know that um, my husband does commercial recycling here and he wants to get out of it. He's like, if he pulls his commercial customers, he pulls his recycling totes from them, um, there's basically gonna be nobody in town that's doing it because right now there's two companies that are doing it. And the other woman who runs a recycling company um, is to asking my husband to buy her out because she doesn't wanna do it anymore because it's just such a pain. And if she leaves, that 6% or whatever is going to go down because there's nobody else that's doing totes or recycling for commercial. It's crazy. So, that is crazy. And I think I'd have to go back and look at that report where I pulled those numbers from, but I think that a lot of the cities, most of those big cities, they mandate commercial recycling. Um, and I think that's might be, I mean, I know everyone hates mandates like that where, you know, we're putting, um, requirements on people but that might be the only way to do it because yeah I mean it's going to cost it's going to cost money one way or the other so if we're requiring everyone to do it then it's not going to cost you're not putting the burden of the cost on I don't know how to explain it but yeah, you're, you're evening it out. So everybody's paying the same cost. So your competitors are paying the same amount and it, it makes it a little bit more fair. But I think um, the problem again is that why would the city mandate that they'd be losing money because that's stuff not going to Trail Ridge. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the backwardness of what's happening here with recycling. Um, so but maybe you could, I, I'd, be, I'd be very interested in to, to see that side of the report pulled from other cities and um, who's mandating, who owns their landfills, um, what cities have high recycling and how, how is that set up? Is it a private landfill? Um, and a lot of cities actually, so right now when you own a house, part of your ad valorem taxes go to pay for your recycling bin. That's how it's paid for. It's, it's a type of ad valorem tax. And that's how it's set up in the city of Jacksonville. But if you're a business owner, you don't pay that tax because Jacksonville is kind of known for not paying a lot of taxes. So um, the business owners don't pay that tax. So all the recycling they have to pay out of pocket rather than paying a smaller tax. So you get a lot of businesses that don't want to pay for the recycling. And in other cities, I believe it's set up differently. So there's business taxes that are in place that cover the cost of recycling for that business. Um, again, I'm not 100% sure on statistics of what, who does water. I, it's just, it's city specific, so it's all very different systems. But that's how Jacksonville is set up and I don't think it's, I mean, it's clearly not working. Nobody here is recycling. <laughs> so anyway, guys, this was amazing um, and I, a very, very good topic. And if you do any type of um, follow-up throughout the semester, uh, please let us know. Maybe we can have you on again towards the end of the semester with a with an update. All right. Well, thank you very much again for having us, and um, you know, look forward to seeing it on YouTube. Yes. Thanks again, guys. Bye. Bye, Christina. Thank you, guys.